I believe that it's scientifically feasible right now to literally eat a big part of climate change. And while you know, there's obviously a lot of groundbreaking science around this idea, its most impressive feature may be that it can actually cross our highly polarized political boundaries, too. Now, boundaries, whether they're scientific or political, are usually a question of perspective. As I was thinking about this question of perspective, I was reminded of the story of the young traveler who comes to a huge river he can't cross. And he's walking up and down the banks of the river looking for a way. And he gets very excited because he spots a wise master on the other side. And he says, wise master, I, I'm trying to cross this river. How do I get to the other side? And the wise master looks back at him and looks down the river. And he looks up the river. And he looks a little puzzled. And he says, my son, you're already on the other side. <laughs> I want to invite you today to think about this challenge from a different perspective. Because I think it's one that will lead both to more powerful paths forward, but also to more paths that we can all take together. So first, some historical perspective. Now, climate change kind of came of age in our, in our consciousness, really in the 1970s. And it really wasn't the headline that it is today. It was really still more a debate among scientists who were just starting this migration towards this consensus around warming really driven by you know, more powerful computer models and better data. The headlines at the time were related, but they were, they were more about things like you know, the Apollo mission and those first views of Earth from, from outer space, that, that idea of Earth without boundaries. And it was about famine and food shortages and fuel shortages and this sense of future shock. And above all, really, this idea of you know, you know, global nuclear winter. And even though this was a decade where you know, regional concerns, things like air pollution, were really becoming global concerns, and where you know, we were becoming kind of increasingly aware of what I'd call the unintended consequences of science and technology, it was also a time of enormous you know, scientific and political innovation. Um, the EPA, uh, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, and people like Norman Borlaug. His Green Revolution is credited with saving a billion people from starvation. And he won the Nobel Prize for it. Now, you know, I don't know if maybe you guys are having a little bit of deja vu now, but it does seem like these headlines are returning, doesn't it? I mean, space is obviously back in the news with things like SpaceX and the you know, uh, Blue Horizon and, and our new spaceship, Mars. And severe weather, I think, is, we can all agree, has been in the news, really, over the last, you know, six months or so. And North Korea seems pretty intent on putting nukes back on the front page. But climate change is, you know, one of the, it is one of the headlines now. But the debate has shifted from being one mostly among scientists to being one now, I think, mostly among politicians, <coughs> with the lines being really drawn more along political and even geographic boundaries. And this brings me to the main shift in perspective I want to talk to you about today. What if we were, just for a second, not think of this as an economic or, or moral challenge of this human waste accumulation, but rather as an imbalance between two fundamental forces that were essentially unleashed by bacterial mutation billions of years ago? and which really drive and form the very essence of our current atmosphere, respiration and photosynthesis. Now, these are kind of the yin and yang of our atmosphere. Respiration, as you may remember or probably don't remember from uh, biology class, is uh, taking oxygen and fuel, and it turns that into energy with water and CO2 as the outputs. And photosynthesis, takes that water, takes that CO2, combines it with light energy, and turns that back into oxygen and fuel. So this is a cycle that has been balancing itself uh, at various levels for billions of years. And the current imbalance is the result of not just human population growth, but also human ingenuity, which has figured out how to rapidly accelerate the, uh, that, that respiration side of the equation 
and essentially overwhelm the ability of photosynthesis to keep up. Now, anyone who, you know, you don't have to get, look any further, really, than the cell phone in your pocket to understand this phenomenon. I mean, besides the obvious fact that every one of you has a cell phone in their pocket, do you think that cell phone, that, that are these massive advances in things like battery technology have been leveraged more for functionality? In other words, you know, you know get, get more apps in there, you know, you know, more video and more social networking and more gaming. Or do you think that that was leveraged more for conservation and energy efficiency? Someone can Google that if you want. <laughs> Even Norman Borlaug's Green Revolution was accomplished by accelerating respiration in the form of fertilizers and pesticides and mechanized farming. And even our responses right now, they still are on that respiration side in the form of trying to divert some of that innovation into you know, technologies and behaviors that limit or, or eliminate respiration, things like renewable energy. And fortunately, this is, you know, been, a lot of this has been pretty successful. But I want to ask you for a second, like, what if we would expand that scope just a little bit further? What if we were to realize for a second, like that traveler, that we were already on the other side of the river? What if we were to look at photosynthesis the same way we looked at respiration? So not as something static or fixed or to be you know, conserved and protected against this horrible onslaught of, of respiration, but as dynamic and open to the same sorts of innovations for the same sorts of economic and functional advantages and with the same sorts of accelerated impacts. And the good news is it's already happening. Technologies are already being developed in things like biomimicking photosynthesis with artificial leaves or turbocharging photosynthesis in the field while at the same time reducing respiration in the form of you know, fertilizers and pesticides. And indoor agricultural approaches sort of industrialized agriculture, and both around traditional crops, but also new, high-efficiency crops like algae and bacteria. These technologies are expanding photosynthesis and turbocharging it. So in the same way that we used innovation to figure out how to take essentially the respiratory power of hundreds of horses and cram that under the hood of your car, we can industrialize photosynthesis and take the carbon reduction power of hundreds of acres of agriculture and compress that into an area the size of a basketball court. And these impacts go beyond just carbon and economics. These could be you know, critical tools for meeting uh, future food system shocks because they're actually insulated from a lot of those climatic effects. And they can expand farming to areas where we can't currently farm, like the Arctic. So to put this in a broad global perspective, converting even just one-fifth of current agriculture to these sorts of industrialized photosynthetic approaches, leveraging these high-efficiency crops like algae and plugged into low-carbon energy sources like wind or hydro or nuclear, would be the equivalent of taking more than half, I'm talking more than half, of all the world's cars off the road. The land use impacts are equally dramatic. You can essentially take a production area the size of India and compress that into an area the size of Rhode Island. So in the 70s, the Green Revolution saved us from starving, but it did so with carbon-positive agriculture. We can have a new green revolution with new technologies and address the exact same problems with carbon-negative agriculture. And aligning these, these deep-seated human instincts for growth and innovation and science and technology with these countervailing carbon reduction forces could also help alleviate our political issue, too. Because these technologies, they're neither anti-nature nor anti-human nature. Now, President Kennedy, in one of the last speeches he ever gave, was to the National Academy of Sciences. 
And in it, he was talking about this role of science um, as, a, as a unifier of knowledge, but also as a crosser of boundaries. Whether those boundaries are between the sciences, or those boundaries are between nations, or those boundaries are between what he called our, our humane and, and scientific concerns. We can cross those boundaries again right now. And I know this for a fact because we already are. Thank you.